believed to be the last imperial Easter egg Fabergé ever made, the Cross of St. George, presented by the Tsar to his mother, the Dowager Empress, on Easter 1916. It honors a medal that the Tsar conferred upon himself. The shell is enameled in yellow with a matte finish. The underpainting of leafy latticework sections off miniature red and white St. George crosses. A gold ribbon enameled in black and orange, the order of St. George colors, loops across the surface. In the aftermath of what was to come, the egg seems to be a final tribute to the Tsar, foreshadowing the end of Romanov rule. In 1916, conditions in Russia worsened. To save the country, members of the imperial circle carried out a plot to murder Rasputin. The holy man was poisoned, shot several times, and dumped in a freezing river. The act spared the country one of its most controversial figures, but failed to save it from revolution in 1917. As food and fuel supplies declined, civil unrest mounted. Strikes and street fighting broke out in the shadow of the Winter Palace. When soldiers joined the revolutionary movement, the government collapsed. Aboard the imperial train at Pskov, Nicholas yielded to demands that he abdicate. He hoped that he and his family would be sent to England, where his cousin King George V ruled. But there would be no exile to a foreign country. After Lenin and the Bolsheviks wrested control of the government, the Romanovs were eventually removed to the town of Ekaterinburg in the Urals. There they were imprisoned in what revolutionaries called the House of Special Purpose. In the pre-dawn darkness of July 16, 1918, guards ushered Nicholas, Alexandra, and their five children into the cellar of the house and executed them. Nicholas was shot first. Alexei, the heir apparent, was next. Alexandra crossed herself before the guns turned on her. Bullets burst corsets full of diamonds that Olga, Tatiana, and Maria had hidden from their captors. Anastasia was the last one to die. She had survived the initial shooting, but guards quickly silenced her cries with bayonets. The bodies were burned, covered in sulfuric acid, and buried in a mine shaft. Its location remained a secret until the fall of communism in 1989. In a blaze of violence, the reign of Nicholas and Alexandra, as well as 300 years of Romanov rule, had come to a sudden end. In the new order, all those associated with the imperial family were forced to flee the country, among them, Peter Carl Fabergé. Posing as a courier to the British Embassy, he escaped Russia in September 1918 and reunited with his family in Lausanne, Switzerland. He died there in 1920. The Bolsheviks seized his St. Petersburg shop and reduced its operation. Finally, the craftsmen left and the stock was sold or removed. But what became of the Imperial Easter eggs? Miraculously, in the chaos of war and revolution, these fragile, precious objects of fantasy survived. Lenin, surprisingly enough, was very conservative. He ordered that the palaces should be sealed and that their contents should be put under lock and key. And everything that was valuable, such as crown jewels and uh, imperial eggs, Fabergé pieces were listed very carefully. All these objects were transferred to the Kremlin, where they were kept virtually unknown till they were rediscovered somewhere around 1921. At that time, the communist regime sought ways to finance their first five-year economic plan. To get hard currency quickly, they made many Romanov art treasures, including Fabergé imperial eggs, available to foreign buyers. 
One was an American entrepreneur, Dr. Armand Hammer. He acquired a number of Fabergés, intending to resell them in the United States. His timing could not have been worse. The depression made any sales difficult. However, by 1933, the American market for Fabergé eggs emerged when Dr. Hammer arranged to sell them through the Lord & Taylor department store in New York. This and other exhibitions initiated the collecting of Fabergé in the United States. Early collectors, including serial heiress and philanthropist Marjorie Merriweather Post, helped make the United States the home of more Fabergé eggs than any other country in the world. Of the 42 Fabergé eggs still known to exist, 29 are in various private and museum collections throughout America. The largest is at the offices of Forbes magazine in New York, home to 12 eggs acquired by the late Malcolm Forbes. My father loved history. The Russian Revolution occurred just two years before he was born. It ironically occurred just one month after Forbes magazine was created. And that was his excuse, ultimately, for creating the Forbes magazine collection, that the uh, capitalist tool should be uh, competing with the Soviets. And uh, he liked to refer to the eggs race. And in fact, he loved assuring Caspar Weinberger when he came to Forbes that while Cap was in the Pentagon, he didn't know for sure who had more missiles. When he came to Forbes, he knew he had more eggs. Collectors are not the only ones who covet the imperial Easter eggs. The general public is fascinated by them, too. In 1996, record-setting crowds attended Fabergé in America, an exhibit that traveled to museums from New York to San Francisco. Why such enthusiastic interest? The answer is in the eyes of the beholder. People are attracted in droves uh, to Fabergé because, there, of course, there is the nostalgia factor. Everything that reeks of Romanovs, of this dreadful calamity, that happened to the poor, sweet girls and, and the rest of the imperial families. This is headline stuff. And Fabergé's glittering little objects of art, they are the most tangible record of what the imperial court was. I don't think they were necessarily meant to, to be taken so seriously the way one might take the Mona Lisa seriously. In their own right, they are incredible works of art, but the fun thing is, is you don't have to be a goldsmith to appreciate them. They are so beautifully made and they are some of them are so whimsical, they just give pleasure. When you look at Fabergé, it's a reminder of, of both the uh, times out of which they came and of the uh, taste of the people who ordered these things and, and also of the jewelers who made them. If we look around now, in our society, we're not producing anything of the quality of these eggs. Why not? We have as much money. Where is the Fabergé of today? He does not exist. No artist can boast the unique combination of talent and patronage that made the imperial Easter eggs possible. They're of a time and place that is no more and will never come again. Yet their enduring value is that they can be treasured forever. Legend says this patch of the Atlantic swallows up its victims. Now, these two experts go head to head to demystify that legend. Their conflicting opinions will pit scientific theory against paranormal activity. Who will solve?